Good afternoon, church. How are you? How was the week? You managed or you survived? You know, surviving is you barely made it, you know. But managing means you are still able to control things around you. We thank God for the gift of life and life eternal through Christ our Lord who loved us so much. So much to the point of calling each one of us by name to be his disciples and to be part of this great community of faith. That is why we can come on Sunday without being pushed from home, freely to come and fellowship with him as we listen to his holy word. It gives me great joy to share from God's word today and the reflection on the topic, Agents of Transformation, Transformed Agents of Transformation. And that is our reflection topic today, Transformed Agents of Transformation. Reverend Canon Sami Wainaina, uh, the outgoing provost of uh, SEK uh, Cathedral down here, said experience is never meant to be a trophy. It's actually meant to be a mirror that helps us reflect. So the experiences that God takes us through in life are just helping us to reflect on how God has so graciously led us. And today we are going to reflect from an interesting story that we all know about. In fact, we've been told from our Sunday school days. It's a common story, the story of Naaman. And the most interesting bit is that though we have heard about this story countless times, we always hear about the big characters in the story. We hardly pay attention to small characters who slip through without being noticed, but are playing a big role as agents of transformation. At the onset, allow me to give just a brief background to this text. It is important to know the socio-political background of the time that uh, the passage was written. And the timing was 930 BC. This is once upon a time, 930 BC. This is exactly what once upon a time means. And Israel had been separate. Uh, Judah and Israel had separated or existed as separate kingdoms for around 80 years by now. So they've been separate kingdoms for quite a while. On their part, Israel had seen nine rebellious kings come and they had introduced something that was very unpleasant before God. If there are things that God would not stomach in the Old Testament is idolatry. That you have another God other than Yahweh. I mean, seriously, that you have another God other than Yahweh. Please don't try this at home. This I don't try this at home thing. So there had been nine rebellious kings who had turned into idolatry and worshipping of the golden calves, worshipping of Baal and other gods. And the Israelites were doing it in the pretext that we are God's chosen people. Atadu, you know? How is it? On the other part, Aram, which is the modern day Syria, was located in the northern east, northeastern part of Israel's capital. And their capital city was named Damascus. This city had water supply from two main rivers. One river was called Abana, another one was called Papa. Abana River flowed down from the snow-capped mountains of Hamon. And so it had clean water, and it was an abundant stream. It was a real main water source. On the other part, for Israel, they had River Jordan, which was not as impressive as Abana or Papa. I now understand why when Naaman was told, go shower in the river, he had, that gave him some bit of uh, upsets. It is like somebody from Transoia, where we come from, and we have a big river called River Nzoia, when you are told to go and shower in River Nairobi, Nairobi River, I mean, you would wonder, what is up with this guy? Does he know rivers or is hearing stories? 
So when Naaman is told, go to the river and shower, that was a big concern to him. He says, we have better rivers at home, not here. And so in verse 1, we are introduced to a man named Naaman. And immediately after the introduction, we are given his reputation. Number one, he, his military status. He is an army commander. And number two, he is from Aram, his foreign nationality. He is the head of Armenian army. The character in focus, Naaman, had leprosy. And when we talk about leprosy, leprosy had actually was a Hebrew word that in the Hebrew had quite a dimension of skin illnesses. Some would be very serious that you had to be thrown out of your community and others were not as severe. So Naaman's case was not very severe because we are told he was at home with his family and in fact occasionally he would make access to the king. Meaning that though he was leprous, his condition was not very severe that had reached a point where he would be thrown out of the camp and uh, from interacting with the rest of the people. And Naaman is introduced and praised as being a great man before his master, the king of Aram. So he is a commander, and the king also commends him as a great man. And we are told about his greatness. And the greatness that we are told about Naaman is quite shocking. And it says, for by him the Lord had given victory to Aram. For by him the Lord had given victory to Aram. I mean, who is Aram? Aram are not the Israelites. God was God of the Israelites, and that is what the Israelites bragged about, that this is our God. In case of conflict, he will stand on our side. But the passage is telling us, by him, Naaman, God of Israel, had given victory to his enemies, the Aram, uh, Aram against the Israelites. In fact, the word that is translated victory is actually referring in military encounters in this passage, refers to salvation or deliverance. And you know from history that Aram and Israel had had countless battles. They were constantly fighting. And so the God of Israel has been supporting the military victory of Aram. That is quite shocking. That's quite shocking. I now understand why Jeremiah in Lamentations chapter 2 verse 5 said, the Lord is like an enemy to us. He's supporting the enemies against the Israelites. And so, when he is in a situation and he goes, you know, he receives this message from the girl in the house that I wish my master knew of the servant of God in Samaria. And so he seeks permission to go from the king. Remember, he's the military army commander. He's an army commander. So he has to report to his boss. And he says, my little girl has said there is some help that can be found in Samaria. And so it is in the enemy territory on the other side. So I need a letter of recommendation from you that can help me access that other territory. And so he goes with a letter from the king of Aram to the king of Israel, saying, I'm sending to you my commander. He is coming for medication in your territory. And when he receives, the king of Israel actually immediately have some indigestion from this letter. He says, I mean, what is up with this neighbor now? Young men would say, Nemakuonea 18, you know? I know what you are looking for. This letter is not just innocent letter. You are looking for war with us. That is why you are sending your commander. How can you send it to, to us and to me and you know I have no healing powers? I am not a doctor. Why are you sending him to, to me? And so he's so concerned. And uh, through the story, you know, now Naaman 
had access to Elisha, and Elisha, in, interestingly, this man goes with a team. He goes with a real team uh, because he was a real commander, and so he would not go alone. He had a team, and he had enough supplies that he was, uh, and goodies that he was taking. And when he accessed Elisha, Elisha does not even come to receive him. He just sends his boy. Please go tell that guy to go shower. And that gives him a very serious concern. Can't you come and, you know, speak in tongues and say some few magical words and then boom, I'm healed? And he goes quite dis uh, discouraged. In fact, I think he had made up his mind that I, he was going home and the next battle with the Israelites would not be a better one, uh, 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 you know, a pleasant one. But something tells him, what is the difficulty? The team around tells him, what is the difficulty? I mean, just a shower. Just a shower only, and it is giving you a problem. Just go shower. And he went and he received his healing. But I'll not major on the entire passage. I'll major on two small verses. In verse 2, we are introduced to a second character. And this character is a young girl. In fact, she's a nameless Israelite girl. I did enough research trying to figure out any clue that would lead us to know the name of this girl. Trust me, I haven't found. If you find, I'll be happy to know. And what we are told about her is that she was captured during the raid between the Israelites and the Armenians. So she was brought uh, from Israel. And we are told she's a servant to Naaman's wife. And we are also told that of her lowly status, in fact, the word that is described, the translation that we get, the English word, a little girl, has actually two emphases. A little, little girl. She was a little, little girl. No wonder they don't name her. And you know, Israel was a patrilineal society. So they concerned so much about the men, so much. And so the point of not mentioning her name is not something that is strange because of the context at which this girl lived. What lessons on transformed agents of transformation can we draw from this passage that we are reflecting on today? Allow me, church, to bring to our attention three lessons for our reflection and meditation as we work very hard and pray so hard to become transformed agents of transformation. Three lessons of reflection. Lesson number one is on transformation. Lesson, lesson number two is on our personal relationship with the Lord. And lesson number three is on forgiveness. Three lessons for our reflection and even meditation as we navigate our Christian walk of faith. Lesson number one on transformation is an agent of transformation must have experienced God's transforming power. An agent of transformation must have experienced God's transforming power. I repeat again, an agent of transformation must have experienced God's transforming power. I repeat again so that it sinks in the head. An agent of transformation must have experienced God's transforming power. Verse 3. Verse 3 says, this is New Living Translation. It says, I wish my master would go to see prophet in Samaria. Then it says, he would heal him of his leprosy. Amplified version, verse 3, says, yes. She said to her mistress, would that my Lord were with the prophet in Samaria, for he would heal him of his leprosy leprosy. Would that my Lord were with the prophet who is in Samaria. And an agent of transformation must have experienced God's transforming power. There are things in life that are so difficult to dispute, church. I mean, we can agree on this. Even if we don't agree, we have to agree. There are things that in life is so difficult to dispute. For example, a personal testimony. 
If I tell you I'm saved, you can't dispute that because you are not me. It's difficult to dispute. This girl had a testimony of what God had done, and she had seen and had experienced. And she knew that this master of mine, with this kind of sickness, I have countless examples of people who have gone through such a situation and have been healed by, you know, the prophet. And so she says, if only I wish my master would go to Samaria to see this prophet. An agent of transformation must have experienced God's transforming power first before you become an agent. The little uns uh, unnamed girl is so much concerned of, concerned of Nama's health that she has the trust, she has the faith, she has the boldness to speak up to General's wife of a prophet in Samaria. And notice that this girl, because of the transforming power of God's holy word in her life, she knows she cannot break protocols. She cannot go and tell her master there is a prophet in Samaria. She knows how things are run. And so she speaks to the wife of the general that I know the solution to general's problem. Please go tell him there is a man in Samaria who can heal him. So that in case the general has more questions to ask, now because he has the powers, he can now come to the girl and say, what were you saying? She follows the order. Her experience from history may not have been a very pleasant one. We are told she is a slave, she's a servant. When you read the history of uh, slavery, people who were taken as slaves went through hell, I tell you. They went through hell. They were captured in raids, you know, and for those who were taken overseas, they would be kept in very bad conditions as they wait to be transported. You need to go to South Coast to a place called Chimoni and see and hear the story. Very terrible conditions. And so people would be kept in a place waiting to be transported. And when the ship comes, they would begin first with the strong men because they were going to fetch good money in the market. They called it Agora. They would go for strong men, first into the ship, plus the foodstuff. And then they would go for the ladies. Though they would not fetch good money in the market as men, they would also add them. And then they would add the dead and the sick and the weak so as to be disposed of into the ocean. And they went. But in case of turbulence, they would dispose of the sick, the old ones. If the turbulence is too much, so, so much, they would, because they cannot offload the food they need in the voyage, and they cannot offload the men because they will fetch good, better returns in Agora, they would say, ladies first. And that is the history behind the statement, ladies first. <laughs> so when these men tell you ladies first, they are saying, kiss the ocean first. <laughs> and so this, this lady had gone through stuff. She has gone through hell, for real. One, she had been taken as a prisoner a prisoner of war, and now she is working in a family of the very same man who captured her. And the man is in a situation, and this lady, because she had been transformed, and she was no longer the same again, she said, I wish my master would go see the prophet in Samaria. This nameless girl, he said in history that she could have been like 12 years of age. She had no power. She had no prestige. I mean, we even don't know her name. She had no popularity. She was a mere servant girl. But she knew the Lord, the God of Israel. She had experienced God's transforming power. She was no longer the same again. Church, my friends, brothers and sisters, Knowing the Lord Jesus Christ as our personal Savior changes everything about us. I repeat again, knowing the Lord as our personal Savior changes everything about us. You can't have a personal encounter with the Lord and remain the same. 
You can't have a personal encounter with the Lord and chase after another Jesus in Tongareni. You can't have a personal encounter with the Lord and search for his second coming in the forest of Shakahola. What are you telling us? What are you telling us? A personal encounter with the Lord transforms us completely. It changes everything. And when I say everything, I mean literally that, everything. There is a, th a song that says, there is a high, wide change since I've been born again. A high, wide change since I've been born again. An encounter with the Lord changes everything about us. Think of these people in the Bible. Saul of Tarsus, the persecutor. He had no stomach for Christianity and no room for justice and mercy for anybody called a Christian. He met the Lord in his uh, Damascus Road experience and it changed everything about the soul of Damascus. He became Apostle Paul, a man who wrote letters, half of the New Testament. You cannot experience the Lord and remain the same. The transforming power cannot leave you the same again, period. It can't. Think of the timid Peter. When he experienced the Lord, everything changed. He laid down his life for Christ. He became a powerful preacher. One sermon, 3,000 people coming to the Lord. He changed completely. Think of the Samaritan woman whom Reverend Okeo taught us last week. An encounter with the Lord changed everything about her. She became a one-word evangelist. Come and see what has happened. She didn't know the four laws of evangelism, but she knew experience. She had experienced the Lord, and she knew what has happened. We cannot encounter the Lord and remain the same. It can't work. It can't work. Transformed agents of transformation must have experienced the Lord. I sat through a case one time of a Christian who had stolen and we had so many questions that we asked him, so many, until one pastor said, maybe we are asking the wrong questions. This young man was called Jacob. And this pastor said, Jacobo, umwai kukiri Yesu Christo kama mwokozi wa maisha yako. And for the first time, that got me off balance. I said, for real, we were asking Jacob the wrong questions. This should be the right question that we are asking. A lot of the challenges that we deal with sometimes show that we have not had that personal encounter with the Lord. Do you know him? Do you know the Lord as your personal savior? Do you know the Lord? Our knowledge of the Lord changes everything about us, everything. It changes our response during tough and challenging times. It changes completely. This young girl was no longer bitter about the experiences. She had experienced the transforming power. She had experienced the Lord. It changes our relationships. Reverend Tarus talked about that some few weeks ago, that sometimes our relationship with the Lord is so important that we have to let go of some friends. It changes everything. It changes our perception about life. It changes how we view family and family relationships. It changes how we view our material and earthly material blessings. It changes how we view our enemies. Stephen, in Acts chapter 7, verse 59, prayed for his enemies. Even as they stoned him to death, he said, God forgive them, for they don't know what they are doing. It changes everything about us. That is why this girl would say, I wish my master would know the prophet in Samaria. The question is, do you know him? You cannot be a sheep in the family of God and still have God-like characteristics. It doesn't work. It doesn't work. You are either a sheep or God, period. There is no gray area here. Do you know him? Our personal encounter with the Lord changes how we view the lost world. 
this young girl said, I wish my master would go and see the prophet in Samaria. He would be healed. Our personal encounter with the Lord changes how we view the world and the lost people around us. We begin to see and we begin to look at them with the eyes of faith and wish that they had an encounter with the Lord. And pray for them that I wish you knew the God whom we serve. It even pushes us to evangelize and win the souls. Prophet Jeremiah said, if I keep quiet, it is like fire within my system. It pushes us, that experience. Some conflicts that we experience today, even in families or in workstations, just show us one thing. My brother, my sister, you need the Lord. Do you know him? Amatunasumbuana bure. This little girl had experienced the transforming power of God, became an agent of transformation because she had experienced God's transforming power. We cannot experience that power and remain the same again. It can't work. 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 I mean seriously, it can't work. It doesn't work. Do you know him? Amatunasumbuana bure. Lesson number two is a lesson on faithfulness. Agents of transformation hold on to faith no matter what happens. Agents of transformation hold on to faith no matter what happens. Verse two, agents of transformation hold on to faith no matter what happens. Verse two says in King, New King James Version, and the Syrians had gone out on raids and had, underline this, brought back captive a young girl from the land of Israel. And then she, it says, she waited on Naaman's wife. This nameless girl gives us a powerful example of a transformed agent of transformation, even in difficult situations even in very difficult situation. We can only pick a few fragments together and try to figure out her life. We know that she was captured in a raid. She was in her own village or town. It is likely that, you know, raids were not friendly engagements. They were not friendly. They were serious. They were deadly. So it is likely that her family is dead and that she had seen things that you would hope our children would never see. Certainly, she was out of her home place, she was out of her country, forcibly against her will. But remember, agents of transformation hold on to faith no matter what happens. We don't know from the text how long she has been there, we don't know from the text how she has been treated in Naaman's house. We don't know. But one thing is clear. She held on to faith no matter what happens. It is of interest that in 1 Kings chapter 19, verse 18, we are told that a remnant would remain within the house of Israel. So it is of interest to know that despite the turbulent period in Israel, there remained a remnant that continued to worship Yahweh regardless of where they had been taken. And it is most likely that this young girl came from one of those families who were firmly rooted in the word of God and were established in faith. An important reminder why we need to establish a good foundation for our children even as they grow. And that is the important ministry of the children's ministry. Establishing a good foundation because agents of transformation hold on to faith no matter what happens. When children have good foundation of faith, they can go anywhere in the whole world and will not be having sleepless nights. They have a good foundation. And that is why she is an inspiration to us, despite being nameless and only one mention in the entire Bible, she stands out as an icon of faith many centuries even after. Not much is said about her, just a few sentences 
in verse 2 and 3 only about her, and that's it, the entire Bible. But she remains an icon because she held on to faith no matter what happens. Can we hold on to God's faithfulness even in our darkest of those times? Or will we abandon him when we feel he has let us down? Matt and Beth Repman wrote a book, a hymn, and in the hymn they wrote these words. When the darkness closes in, Lord, still I will say, blessed be the name of the Lord. Holding on to faith no matter what happens. The Bible is dotted with examples of men and women who, like this little girl, held on to faith regardless of what happened. Prophet Habakkuk, in chapter 3, verse 17 and 18, says these words. Interesting words from Prophet Habakkuk, who had seen things. He had seen the enemies come and raid and do so much that he even questioned God. And when God answers him, Habakkuk says these words. Though the victory does not blossom, and no fruit is on the vines, though the produce of the olive fails, and the field heals no good, no food. Although the flock is cut off from the fold, and there is no herd in the stall. Then he says, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will exalt the God of my salvation. Habakkuk says, no matter what happens, I will hold on to faith. Church, my friends, what situation are you struggling to make sense of at the moment? What is that situation that you are currently struggling to make sense of it? Is it a tragic accident? Please hold on to faith no matter what happens. Is it a job loss? Please hold on to faith no matter what happens. Is it an inexplicable illness? Please hold on to faith no matter what happens. Is your marriage on the rocks? Please hold on to faith no matter what happens. Is it bereavement, loss of loved ones? Please hold on to faith no matter what happens. Is it an addiction to substance or habits? Maybe you have an, a member of the family who is addicted to substance or some habits. Hold on to faith no matter what happens. Maybe you've experienced stillbirth in your family. Please hold on to faith no matter what happens. Is it a relationship that is gone south? Please hold on to faith no matter what happens. What situation are you currently struggling to figure out and to make sense out of it? <clears throat> the passage at hand from the story of this little girl, it reminds us to hold on to faith no matter what happens. Agents of transformation are faithful to him no matter what happens, even to the very end. And I pray that the Lord helps us and gives us that strong faith to hold on to him no matter what happens. Lesson number three is a lesson on forgiveness. Lesson on forgiveness. Agents of transformation forgive others and self. Agents of transformation forgive others and self. I repeat, agents of transformation forgive others and self. Verse three. And this is where the rubber meets the road. This is not for the babies in faith. These are for adults in faith. Agents of transformation forgive others and self. Verse 3 says, if only my master would see a prophet. The translation that we have in uh, Amplified of verse 3 says, if only my Lord would see. It talks about my Lord. In NIV, it talks about my master. This passage reminds us the, the power of forgiveness. 
the power of forgiving others and self. Imagine this girl had forgiven, had forgiven Naaman, had forgiven all the soldiers who raided them. She had forgiven them so much that she would freely call Naaman my master and my lord. She would not say, Ile kitu, iko na shida. She had freely forgiven. Imagine she is working in her house, in the house of the man who took her into captivity and perhaps had killed her loved ones. But now she is free from that pain. She had forgiven. This is not an easy journey. It's not easy. It is said forgiveness is good for your bones. It is go good for your mental health. It is good for you. Imagine being captured in such a dramatic incident, dramatic raid, that left their family defranchised forever, forever. This girl was not imagining of a time when she would go home and have fellowship with family members again. That was gone story. She's been taken as a slave. She's been tortured. She's gone through tortures that she would not complain to anybody. She's powerless. This girl could have spent her entire life bitter, blaming God and cursing her captors day and night. And night. But she doesn't do that. She has forgiven. In fact, she directs her captors to help where help could be found. She says, if only my master would go see the prophet. Why go and see the prophet? It's not just going to have a conversation with the prophet. To go and see the prophet so as to be healed. This girl wants her master to be healed. She has forgiven. She was not praying and saying, count, count the days. Count the days. This one is going. She had forgiven and sought to direct her to where help could be found. It is only the transforming love of Jesus Christ that gets us to this level, my friends. It is only the transforming love of Jesus Christ that gets us to this level. Nothing else. No magic, no witchcraft. It is only the transforming love of God that gets us to this level. Church, the passage at hand reminds us to stop complaining about circumstances and situations which God has put us in. He knows we are in those situations. He knows. It is not breaking news to him. He knows that we are in those situations. Stop complaining. Stop being bitter about them. Stop complaining about your spouse. I mean, whom did you want to have that fellow or that lady? Honestly, whom did you want to have? Stop complaining about them. Stop complaining about your children. Stop complaining about your neighbors, the difficult neighbors that God brings to help us improve our prayer life. Stop complaining about them. Improve your prayer life. Stop complaining about your body shape. I mean, whom did you want to have that body? Stop complaining about your job or your bosses. Stop complaining. Be agents of transformation. Forgive. Because forgiveness heals. Forgive others and forgive self. And forgiving self means there are situations, there are things that you can do in life that you say, I shouldn't have acted that way. Learn to say, I'm so sorry. Forgive yourself. Even as you forgive others. Conduct yourself in a way that non-believers will be inclined to recognize the integrity of our faith and give credibility to our testimony. And say, who you are, I'm a for real. Because we have grown. We have learned to forgive others and forgive self. The late Bishop Kivengere of Uganda, Festo Kivengere of Uganda, wrote a book that is entitled Revolutionary Love. It is available online. And he talks about how the love of God compelled him to forgive even the people who had caused him so much pain. And he said as he was sitting in All Soul Cathedral in London, listening to the sermon from John chapter 3, verse 16, for God so loved the world, he asked himself, is this whole world that the Bible is talking about, does it include Idi Amin Dada, who has caused me a lot of pain? And God convicted him when he was seated there that yes, it includes him. And he wrote and said, I love Idi Amin. 
agents of transformation, forgive others and forgive self. The Bible in Philippians chapter 1, verse 27 says, whatever happens, conduct yourself in a manner that is worthy of Christ. And a manner that is worthy of Christ is not moving around with bitterness and with pain. Forgive others and forgive self. This is not an easy journey. No, no, it's not an easy road. No, no, it's not an easy road. But we are commanded to do it. When God provides an avenue that we interact with the people who have caused us so much pain, we share the love of Christ with them. And we share it openly. This girl says, as he had the complaint of his master, her master, about the sickness. Maybe he woke up in the morning and shouted, what on earth is this leprosy? And she was out in the kitchen and says, I wish my master would know about a servant of God in Samaria. Remember, from that point on, the history of this man changed. And you know the Bible is silent, but I wish the Bible had told us what happened after Naaman came back and was healed. Would that girl still be a slave girl in that family? Forgiving others and self frees us and takes us to the next level in our walk of faith and our walk with the Lord. Church, we live in a fallen world. We live in a fallen world. We are wronged and we wrong others on a daily basis. Even pastors are not immune to this. Let us learn to forgive others and forgive ourselves. This baggage of pain that we carry around, the baggage of bitterness, cannot make us effective agents of transformation. It can't. Please let us learn to forgive. What is that one area that you are struggling to forgive? Is it your spouse? May God help you to forgive. Is it your fiancé? Alikuwacha kwa mata. May God help you to forgive. What on earth kwa mata? And they do things that when you hear your ears tickle. Please forgive. Please forgive. Is it your children who are doing things that give you sleepless nights? Please forgive. Forgive others and self. Is it your close or distant relatives? Please forgive. I read on a Twitter a young man complaining that I stopped, it was raining, and I saw somebody on a motorbike uh, carrying a lady whom I know, a distant relative of mine, and I stopped and said, please get into the car, and the lady said, Unataka kwenda kunderoga, and proceeded with the motorbike, and it was raining. And gave a lot of pain to this man. Please forgive, forgive others, and forgive self. Is it your business partner who has caused you so much pain and robbed you of your business deals? Please forgive others and self. Is it your supervisor for those in academies, academic field? Is it your supervisor? Please forgive. I encountered a Muslim girl in the university who was complaining bitterly. I didn't know her, she didn't know me. We bumped into each other. She was carrying her pile of uh, thesis and had gone to see her supervisor to sign and the supervisor told her, how can I sign before you even sign? Go and sign, come back next week. And she said, just signature. And she looked for a pen she didn't find and so she came bitter and we bumped into each other and she told me, sir, do you have a pen? I said, yes, I have a pen. What is the issue? Let's go to the office. I had a pen here. And then I took her to the office. We opened the door. She saw chaplaincy and said, oh, so this is chaplaincy. We got in and I told her, I brought you on purpose. What is the issue? And she told me the long story. And I told her, I'm going to give you this pen. But this pen, it was not this one. This pen is used to sign marriage certificates. So with all that bitterness, you cannot use this pen to sign your documents. Would you forgive your supervisor before you sign your documents? And she said, I said, even in Islam, they encourage people to learn to forgive others. Would you forgive him? And he said, yes, let me forgive him. And I told her, please sign your documents. 
What is that thing that is causing you a lot of pain? My brother, my sister, may God help you to forgive. I'm tempted to put a basket here and say, please write down and bring it here so that we pray over it. But we don't have that time for today. Please write it down. Write it down on your small piece of paper. You say, this man or this lady has, Lord, this one has caused me so much pain. I forgive him every day, but I still find I have not forgiven. Help me to forgive. Because it's not something that is going to happen instantaneous. It's a process. It's a process of learning to let it go. Write it down and say, God, I pray that you give me the grace to forgive this one who has caused me so much pain. This girl was not healed overnight that you would recommend her boss for healing elsewhere. She must have gone through the process. Transformed agents of transformation have learned the power of forgiving others and self. Have you forgiven those who have wronged you? Have you forgiven them? May God help you and give you the grace to forgive. It is not you alone. All of us are in it. We struggle. We struggle. Because we live in a fallen world. May God help us to forgive. Three lessons to take home for today from this passage. Lesson number one on transformation. Agents of transformation have experienced God's transforming power. Have you experienced that power? Lesson number two, on faithfulness. Agents of transformation, hold on to faith no matter what happens. Are you holding on to faith for a small challenge, a small SMS causes you to curse God and curse everybody? Lesson number three on forgiveness. Agents of transformation, forgive others and forgive self. Church, this is the word of the Lord. May the Lord bless us and continue reminding us to always embrace this transformation by being experiencing that transforming power, by being agents of transformation, holding to faith, and also by forgiving others and self. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us be upstanding as we affirm this holy word ever true, changing me and changing you. May the Lord bless you and be gracious to you. May he shine his face upon you and grant you grace as we walk as transformed agents of transformation.